so what I'd like to talk about, we've seen lots of research, lots of interesting stuff going on in research labs. What we really want to know is when we're actually going to be able to buy some of those things, and what, when we can buy them, interact with them, what are they going to do for us? Um, a lot of people are saying that the products that come the system are going to be the next great technical revolution. We've had the industrial revolution, we've had the communications revolution, we've had the computer revolution. Now it's revived. Where are we? We're about there. We have a long way to go. It's just starting. So we tend to use the phrase that we are, that robotics is on the cusp. It's just taking off. Um, we're finding that we get more and more press stories, there's more and more product out there, but there's still a long way to go. In the UK, uh, there are two documents that are publicly available where you can uh, find out what we think in the UK might be the impact. And I want to talk mainly about the second one of these, the landscape book. If you take a look within the UK, you look at the sectors within the UK that may well be impacted by robotics, you can break them down into, into four different areas. Um, there's manufacturing and agri-food, there's healthcare and consumer, transport in cities, and energy utilities in the environment. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of those sectors and look and see how robotics might impact upon them. The first thing is to look at why we would actually bother economically to develop robots. Um, robots contribute to the economy, uh, and if they don't, we won't build them. So what are the drivers? Well, the first one is an economic driver. It's, it's, it's about gaining jobs, competitiveness, about making things more efficient. The second is a society one. Uh, several people today have talked about the elderly care um, market in, in assistive technology. Um, the UK, along with most of the other developed nations, is going to have a serious problem by 2050 in the percentage of people available to care for the elderly will be significantly reduced over what we have today. Um, and we, this is, will be a crisis in terms of, of the, the numbers of people who have to be uh, spend a lot of their time looking after their elderly relatives. They will not therefore be contributing to the economy. Uh, so Japan, the US, most of Europe. Uh, are engaged, and, and one of the solutions, it's not by any means the only solution, but one of the solutions is to use robotics technology. Um, markets will drive robotic development if you can do something more efficiently with a robot, then markets will tend to make sure that that is where uh, they go. And finally, users will find robots increasingly doing things that they don't want to. So the Dyson 360i will clean your room. Not something we all necessarily want to spend our time doing, so a robot will do it for you. What do we get? Well, we get a number of things coming out the other end. To put, put it simply, we get simpler systems. So by using a robot, it becomes simpler to do things. So surgeons will use robots because the, ro the operation becomes simpler with a robot. It takes the risk out of it, it takes the time out of it, it maybe makes it a better process. We use robots in factories because uh, it improves the way, it makes it simple, simpler the way that we actually, um, we actually make a product. We we'll use robots because they improve our utilization of resource. Uh, they may contribute to energy usage production, but if we take transport as a good example here, our roads, as anybody knows driving around Bristol uh, in the rush hour, is un has under capacity. There, there is not enough road for all the people who want to drive on it. So if by using autonomous vehicles you can increase the capacity of that road, those roads, and make the journey to work much, much quicker, or the journey home at the end of the day, perhaps more importantly, much quicker, then that is clearly a benefit. So we have improved utilization. Extended reach. Again, today I've talked about having an avatar which is going to look after your grandmother. Uh, so your, your reach is extended into your grandmother's home. Uh, extended reach might also mean maintaining a nuclear reactor. 
We can't go into an active nuclear reactor, but we may well be able to send a robot in there, remotely controlled, in order to be able to, to fix that nuclear reactor and extend, extend its life and reduce risk. Robots will remove people from risky activities. They will be able to remove people from having to go out in, in, in search and rescue missions. They will remove the risk uh, potentially in, in uh, some sort of surgery, particularly neurosurgery. Um, so there are a number of, these are four basic things that we get from using robots. Now, in the UK, there's a whole structure uh, of how uh, robots might end up in our society. So we have the government, uh, which generates regulation and legislation and policy. There are the research organisations up here which develop the technology. We have sectors, the companies, non-governmental organisations, etc., which drive those different industries. And we have the people that are going to be in the supply chain, the actual, the, the actual manufacturers, innovators, the people that put the systems together because you might have a robot, but you actually need to install it. You need to put it and connect it to all the other robots or all the other systems that are in, 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 in that particular sector. We have people supplying components and services. So there is a whole infrastructure here that will need to be in place in order to, for robots to become a valued part of the economy. So, robots will extend Robotics to extend its impact into almost every human activity. And this is part of the message that we need to get across. Robots have today only been in factories or maybe doing, a, 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 doing some cleaning in your house, but that really has been the limit. But the potential is that they will actually extend right out into every human activity. And it's going to be disruptive. So that disruptive technical advance doesn't occur in isolation. It's going to impact on society and it's going to impact on the economy. So we are going to see changes in jobs. We're going to see changes in the way that we do things. We're going to see changes in the way that technology is going to change how we live our lives. In the same way that the computer has changed it, mobile phones have changed it, robotics is going to change it as well. And if we understand this landscape, in other words, how robots will in 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 space will come into our society, then we will have to have a we will be much better to, in, in terms of setting our strategy and our policy and able to control it and do what we want. So I want to look at one or two different areas. The first one is, is the agri-food market. Um, robotics impacts across almost the entire agri-food chain, from at one end, at farming, looking at plowing, preparing fields, growing crops, planting, harvesting, packing the produce on the farm. Where do robotics come into this? Well, we already have autonomous tractors, uh, autonomous combine harvesters gathering, gathering bigger crops, but these things will also uh, move down into, into the much more detailed uh, crops. So there's, there's, there are robots which will de-weed uh, exactly around lettuces in a field uh, as the tractor drives down the field. And what benefits do we get? Well, the first is you may be able to apply pesticides locally to the individual um, areas where there is a there is a pest problem. So you don't mass spray an entire field. You spot the robot spots where it's needed, and it just sprays that in a particular area. The robot, while it's going through the field, will also spot what's going on in the field. Look at the crop. We'll look at the growth rates. We'll look at the yield. It will look to see whether it's harvestable. You may be able to even then selectively harvest. So the strawberry pickers we saw, they're just going to be using a human to go in there and detect the right strawberries and pick the right ones out. So we just you can use a robot to do that. Um, if you're um, collecting potatoes, you may be able to actually work out where which parts of the potato field have got good potatoes and which ones haven't by, by using a ground penetrating radar to see how big the potatoes are under the ground before you dig them out. So again, a lot of uh, information here. Also, a connection that I want to explore is the connection between robotics, big data, and information, and the Internet of Things. So here in farming, very good illustration, pests don't stay within farm boundaries. They move between farms. And 
There are lots of different pesticides, and some might work, and might, some might not work. So if one farmer discovers that one particular pesticide really works very well on that particular pest, big data can communicate that information to the neighboring farmers, so that they go then spray five different pesticides to find out which one works. They just spray the one the guy next door found actually worked. Now, of course, that could happen because they just talk to each other, but it, over bigger regions, the data that you build up will actually give you that information over a bigger scale. Moving through, that produce, very often we want to get that to the, to the supermarket shelf very quickly. So automated harvesting, automated transport, and automated packaging will move that across both into the food processing area, so making sandwiches, making boxes full of, of, of supermarket produce, can all be automated. So a cardo will be here a bit later on today. Um, they're in the back end of this process, trying to work out how they can use robotics in taking in this produce and packing and wrapping and delivering. And then out into wholesale and retail, we can see that we would get uh, robots potentially packing vans, robots potentially delivering materials to supermarkets, delivering food, and eventually packing shelves. So you can see that robotics would impact right the way along this entire agri-food chain and would completely change the way that that currently works. In manufacturing, at the moment we're very used to a system whereby somebody designs a product and if it requires a certain amount of assembly or instruction, most often people will, the, the company will go to China or one of the other lower wage economies to have that product made and it was shipped back in volume. Now the time of doing that is quite a long period of time. You have to actually place orders three to six months in advance to get, to get back a container full of product uh, six months later. So if you're trying to hit Christmas, you actually have to get your products out into, into China in the beginning of the summer in order to be able to get them back in time. What we want to be able to do in Europe is to bring that manufacturing back Bring, robotics brings manufacturing back into areas where there are high wage economies. So the reason why, why car manufacturing is still in existence in Germany, or in Italy, or now in the UK, so the UK now has a very vibrant car manufacturing sector, is because of robotics, it's because of automation. And while that is one particular sector in particular, we need to be able to flow that down into these small and medium sized enterprises who are doing mid-scale manufacturing uh, so that the jobs that will come back into those companies, not in the assembly operation, because obviously that's going to be done through through, through robotics, but in the auxiliary uh, operations that go around a company because their profitability went up. They're selling more product, they need more marketing people. They're, they need people who are maybe dealing with the global business. Um, and so that's where the, the, the jobs will be created. What you also get in this is a disruptive design flow. We now have the possibility, because you have automation in the factory, that when somebody discovers that actually red deck chairs are selling really well this year, and in fact they ordered green ones from China, that's a real problem. You're not going to sell so many jet deck chairs because yours are green and red ones are selling really well. If you have a robotic factory that is literally making to order, and that is efficient and still cost effective. The moment you discover that people are buying more red ones, you simply ask the factory to produce more red ones. You discover that your sizing is a bit different. Maybe you can change the size. You can now make, make deck chairs to your size, to a particular size. So we have a much higher level of uh, bespoke manufacture, but built into volume where you can still ensure that price is competitive. Medical and healthcare. Um, <coughs> are already used, albeit very, uh, at a very lowish level, um, in surgery. Uh, so the Defensi system is used for specific op operations uh, already, uh, quite extensively. There are, uh, there is um, also used uh, different types of robots used in, in um, neurosurgery in terms of location, locating uh, positions around the head. Robotics is used in patient positioning uh, within an operating theatre, uh, particularly uh, for radiotherapy and some surgical uh, procedures. 
Um, so this is an area where I mean, there is already extensive um, uh, use of robotics, but there is, there is much more to go. You can also see it being used within a hospital environment in terms of um, uh, delivery of services within, the, within a hospital, delivery of linen, of medication, of food. And in fact, South New Hospital that it already involves, uh, already uses uh, robotics, robotic trucks within its, uh, its back operation in order to shift um, linen around. So, so again, we're seeing, beginning to see more use uh, in, in these areas, and we will see it much more in outpatient in diagnostics, and, and we're also aware of things like um, the, the exoskeleton market. But again, this is coming. So the impact again in healthcare of robotics is going to be quite considerable. Cities. Um, I can never remember the numbers, but basically more people are living in cities than in rural communities. And it is increasing. So um, I know um, the, the London Borough of Greenwich, reasonably well, and they have a, a digital strategy. Um, they've got to absorb something like another 100,000 residents in the next 15 years. Um, so they, they are looking at how they can use robotics in a smart city in order to make the infrastructure support these huge growths that they're, that they're trying to experience. Whether that's in waste management, environmental monitoring, inspection of maintenance of the infrastructure, um, or in utility installation. Again, robotics can all uh, be being used in those different areas. In transport, uh, there are lots of opportunities in terms of, of, of traffic control. Uh, as we've already mentioned, you, you, you need to make maximize the utilization of the roads. There are also lots of, lots of applications in um, Energy, energy distribution um, in the utility sector. I imagine robots drilling holes under the road putting pipes in rather than having to dig up the road from the surface. Um, you can imagine uh, robots being used to inspect and repair also in your home. So lots of different areas where robotics will get used over the next 20 to well, next 10, 20, 30 years. What's it worth? Well, the numbers here show the UK economy, uh, these are based on numbers from the government, uh, based, uh, I think, with the, uh, the 2012 figures. Um, and if you look at the sizes of these economies um, in the UK, you can see that there's a huge healthcare and secure, uh, consumer economy, uh, less so manufacturing, uh, transport to cities about 198 billion, 180 billion uh, energy and utilities. So those are the sizes of the economies within the UK. So if you can imagine that robotics might impact 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 percent in these markets, so if you take the healthcare and consumer market and we manage to uh, penetrate that market to, to the degree of maybe just 1 or 2 percent, you can see we're talking about 6 billion pound market price. So these are not insignificant markets, even at very low penetration rates in terms of the robotics market. What's important here, from a government perspective, is that actually it's, it's the value impact on sectors that really matters. It's not the value of the, the robotics industry in its own right. It's, it's, it's the impact that, that that robotics has on the market, on the global economy, on the UK economy, on the European. And that's that's what we what people need to concentrate on. It's 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 not the value of the robot robots themselves. It's the impact that they have on the wider economy. So what do we do within the UK? Well, we have. Um, Apart from business innovation and skills, and I appreciate that after 12 o'clock today, I might actually have to update this slide, given what the Chancellor is about to stand up and talk about. Um, but uh, at the moment, we have Innovate UK, which deals with close to market work, and the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, which deals with research in UK universities. Um, and uh, there are two uh, groups underneath. Uh, this group here, special interest group on robotics and autonomous systems, so I chair that particular group. And there is a parallel group under EPSRC, the UK RAS Network. Um, and these two groups uh, advise upwards uh, about EPSRC, the UK RAS Network. Um, and these two groups uh, advise upwards uh, about what we think the, U the UK should be doing. And uh, underneath the RAS C group, which is managed by the Knowledge Transfer Network, 
We have a whole series of regional networks which are being set up, the most, uh, the only one currently in operation, which is the Northern Robotics Network, very successful in launch a few months ago. Uh, we're currently working to set up a, a regional network in, in the West, so that we have a Southwest Robotics Network, um, and obviously in collaboration with, with the local, uh, lo local laboratories and the local companies. What do we do within the UK? Well, we have a strategy. Uh, this is a strategy that's, that's agreed um, uh, across the community. And it consists of looking at these, uh, 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 connecting innovation to the marketplace by promoting what we call assets, and I'll explain what those are in a moment. Skills, that's obvious, and clusters. So we find that in the UK we have a lot of regional clusters, a lot of expertise um, in, in the local regions. And through coordination, there's challenges. So, what do I mean by an asset? It might be a farm, hospital, deep mine, airport, undersea pipeline. These are places where we would hope to be able to go and actually try robots. It would be a, an area we would set out, a farm uh, or, or a pipeline or whatever, where we allow robots to go and, go and run. Uh, and this is something that we have, we, we're currently working on. Challenges. Things like setting robots up to farm an acre of land for a year. We would like to go to land UAV at Heathrow. It would be a great thing to actually be able to achieve. Um, map out the North Sea pipelines. Very difficult thing to go and do. Nobody knows exactly where some of those pipelines are or what condition they're in, more important. Um, deliver samples in a hospital. Um, drive through a town. So these are all quite realistic, down to earth things that relate to where robots are going to go. We need to set these up as challenges. And we need to get people engaged with actually making them happen. So, these are the hot spots in the UK for research. We've got to get that research to market. This is what Innovate UK does. So these are catapults. Um, so these are all the different expertise centres for close to market activity in the UK. And the government report, published 2014, suggested that these ought to be expanded at the rate of two a year. We'll find out whether that's actually really going to happen. What's important here is that robotics and autonomous system impact on nearly all of these categories. It's so cross-disciplinary that, that almost every single one of these categories, at some way, will have to interact with robotics technology. Again, coming back down to how we make this work, um, SMEs are a very critical part of this mix. We need people to actually set up SMEs. They represent 90% of the private sector business, 60% of the private sector employment, and 48% of the private sector turnover. Now, a lot of those SMEs are small-scale operations, painters, decorators, etc. But within them, there are uh, a high percentage of, of innovative companies which you know, we need to stimulate. So globally, most RAS companies are SMEs, and we have to try and work out how we build strong, successful SMEs. How we encourage people to go and reach a market with a new product. And that depends very, obviously very critically on funding and investments. So last of all, I just want to leave you with a picture of some UK robots. So these are all UK robots. They are all, well, almost all of them, commercial products, or very close to commercial products. And interestingly, quite a number of them are based down in this part of the country. So that is local, that is local, and that is local. Um, and in fact, that is local as well. Um, so there's very strong robotics down here in the West. Thank you very much. embedded knowledge in a lot of manufacturing, it's about the processes, it's about the materials, and it's why actually over the last 200 years manufacturing has stayed very niche. So, um, excuse me, 
Dyson is a good example. They also protect everything that they do very, very heavily. So that's going to stay here in terms of that expertise. I'll take some examples from uh, the car manufacturing industry. So there are, there are manufacturers of particular individual components that go into cars. Their expertise is knowing exactly what the material mix is, or exactly how to machine that particular part in a particular way. And that expertise doesn't transfer because nobody talks about it. It's held within the company. So that's how you keep it. Williams at the Bay, he will be able to, he will be able to um, uh, make a good 